All right, uh, let's start. Um, this workshop is, or this tutorial is on uh, the uh, data package that came along with um, some the first release of the Iris data. And that's a numerical simulation made with a code called BFOST. And uh, BFOST is this thing. In Nordic mythology, this is a bridge between the uh, human's world and the god's world. So that's very fitting, right? Um, and it's made of water, ice, and fire, as, we, as is obvious, um, which is pretty fitting for MHD. So um, there's surprisingly many of you here, but um, I'll just uh, get started. And we've, I'm one of the ones uh, having this tutorial. Juan is the other one. And I'm going to start giving you an overview of what a numerical code actually does, why it does it, and what it shouldn't be doing, but sometimes do anyway. Um, so the first, first question, of course, you ask is, why on earth would you do something so complicated? Is there actually anything to gain from this? And uh, we, of course, believe um, there is a very good reason. Um, it's, um, it's very difficult to get um, a direct answer out of the very complex uh, observations that we get, especially now with iris, high resolution, high time cadence, uh, spectral information. Um, so we have to uh, be able to compare it with something. And this is where numerical codes come in, because analytical models are, uh, can have huge problems uh, explaining the observations we, we get. But uh, numerical codes, <clears throat> I'll give you a 10 minute intro. This is uh, extremely fast and it'll, I'll skip over all the complicated things. So I'll try to explain uh, what they can be used for, if they are reliable, uh, what they shouldn't be used for, and then what's included in the, um, in the data that's been released with, um, with, the, uh, with the IRIS data. Um, so to begin with, a numerical code is something that uh, tries to make a good approximation to a continuous function by splitting it into uh, specific points. Um, and that's, of course, not ideal. And um, one of the things that the numerical codes, uh, how they are described is usually by the order of the solvers that they use. And um, that's uh, not sure everybody actually knows what that means, but a higher order solver, um, you can think of it as trying to approximate this function, this continuous function, uh, as a higher and higher order polynomial that you are trying to fit to this function, just given these few points. And um, here I've made, I started out by made, making a uh, function which had uh, the same, roughly the same amount of power at all scales. So this is 1 over k and this is power. And uh, the white curve is the uh, sort of input function or the approximation to the continuous function. So here are very small scales in distance and these are very large. And uh, what you see, there's more power up here, but this is sort of the white line is sort of the, the true function. This is the one that we are trying to fit. And um, I then did a uh, interpolation, uh, half a point up between uh, two given points, half a point up and then back down, just to see what is the effect, effect how well does it actually approximate this, this uh, function. And uh, if the world was ideal, you would return to exactly the same function, right? You just interpolate half a point up and then back down half a point. So you should get the same function. But that's not the case. Um, this white line is what we should get. This yellow line is then a first order uh, operator. So basically, in order to get uh, a point which is halfway between two given points, you basically just uh, take the difference between those two points and then you get the value in the middle. And if you do that twice, 
you can see you lose a lot of power down at small scales. Uh, but at large scales, it pretty much reproduces what we have. The code that we are using is a, a higher, has a higher order, and that higher or we have a fifth order operator, and that then does this instead. That's the blue line. So it's better than a first order, but it cannot reproduce the curve perfectly. <clears throat> so from this, it should be obvious that the higher the, um, the higher the order of the solvers, the better. But there's a, a specific case where that's actually not true. If you have a discontinuity, <clears throat> so this is now our function f, and it has this break, it's this white line. And now we do exactly the same thing. You interpolate half a point up and then half a point down, and the result you get for the first order operator is this yellow thing, which doesn't look too bad. The problem with higher order operators is that you get this ringing on the edges. And this ringing uh, can actually uh, at times be seen um, in published results. And this is, of course, something that we are trying to get rid of. And to get rid of this, you need um, some sort of smart diffusion um, operator to be added on top of this standard one. <clears throat> and I'll just show you how, in a proper example, how this actually looks. This is an OSAC tang test. This is a uh, uh, complicated MHD test. It tests numerical codes. It produces all kinds of weird um, uh, shock fronts, um, both in density, in pressure, in magnetic field. Um, so it's a very difficult test for a code to, to handle. So if we let it go on in time, you can see down here there's problems showing up. This is a very sharp uh, front in, uh, in pressure, and you have the same sort of problems up here. And these are, of course, not real. These are errors made by the numerical code. So if we try to, let me just go back. If we try to plot a line that goes through this point where you saw worse and worse errors, I'll just let this go through, then <clears throat> the, uh, this is when the ringing starts showing up. And you could actually see it on the picture. And if we let the time go, you can see what actually happens. So obviously, this is not well represented by this numerical code. I have to say, this is a, an experiment I made uh, yesterday, and I made it as unstable pretty much as I could. So this is not what usually happens in our simulations. <clears throat> OK, so this is one of the pitfalls. So do you see something like this in a numerical code? You, you should tell yourself. They're squeezing everything they can get out of this, and perhaps they've squeezed a bit too much. Okay, And of course, you see them say, oh, fantastic, this is a great wave going through the box. <laughs> it's, it is a wave, but it's not made by physics. Okay, <clears throat> So there's also a number of misunderstandings when it comes to numerical codes. Um, I've listed a couple of them here, and I'll just, these are the most often heard uh, misunderstanding. The first has to do with the magnetic Reynolds number. And the second one is uh, whether we can actually trust them at all if the resolution is not high enough. So uh, the magnetic Reynolds number, <clears throat> this is a number that's uh, important. This is basically just a number that represents the, the um, the difference between this term and that term. You can see this is, a, uh, this is uh, the induction term of the evolution of the magnetic field. And this is basically just a, uh, this is just a diffusion term. right? So if you imagine that you have a, uh, a magnetic field uh, with some sort of in, uh, homogeneity in it, and this thing is very, very large, then the magnetic field is just going to smooth completely out. 
There's not going to be anything left. You're just going to have a constant magnetic field. While if this one is generally much larger, then you can actually build up all kinds of weird structures. And um, in the solar corona, this term is generally very, very small. Um, the, the ratio of these two, so the size of this is the typ typical velocity times the typical length divided by the size of this thing, which is uh, roughly this uh, diffusion, magnetic diffusion. Um, and very often we are asked, what is the magnetic Reynolds number? But that's actually not uh, very easy to answer because this thing is not constant. And uh, hardly any codes actually have this constant. And as it turns out, neither does nature. Uh, in a reconnection process, for instance, um, if this is constant, then you can pretty much only do uh, the slowest form of reconnection. And we know from the sun, they, there's fast reconnection everywhere. Otherwise, we would not see a flare. So this is not constant. The question is, of course, how, how does this depend on what parameters? And that's, uh, at the moment, nobody can really tell us. <clears throat> so we don't know the dependencies of this thing. Uh, so what we've done is we've minimized it as much as we can and then uh, made it, uh, created it in a way that will make this, this solution of this um, equation uh, stable. So we don't get this ringing. And that's the only thing we are doing. And there's been a number of numerical experiments that's tested what actually happens when you change this thing, uh, increase it or decrease it. And um, they all point towards that the size of this um, diffusion parameter basically just says the smearing you get in your box. So do you have a very large value here, then it's basically like looking, uh, it's basically like uh, having uh, iris that's then looking through water or something like it. You, everything is just smeared out and you can't tell any details. Um, which is of course good, so that just means that the numerical experiments we do are believable to the scale where it's resolved, where it resolves things. Below that we can't say anything. <clears throat> okay. So the next two misunderstandings, these are, uh, they are mentioned uh, often, but uh, the last couple of years, especially Jim Klim Klimchuk has come up with an, an example where he says that, uh, that the numerical experiments we do are not believable. So I'm gonna try to explain why that's not true. So the thought experiments that he sets up is the following. So you have magnetic fields standing on two plates um, both in the same direction. I've labeled them here uh, as red and blue arrows. And then this plate is driven to the right. Okay? So after a while, uh, these, this magnetic field will start uh, to slant, while these ones still are going to point straight up. And you have here an angle between the two uh, field lines across this uh, uh, this boundary, which is some angle. Um, and if you keep this going, of course you get more and more slanted uh, field lines. And Jim's argument is then that, well, if, if, this, uh, if you have a high magnetic diffusivity, you will have reconnection here, and then the, uh, once you get that reconnection, the structure of the magnetic field will be dictated by your diffusivity. Because the earlier it happens, if it happens very, very early, then these lines on this side is going to be almost straight up. If it happens very late, then they are going to lie in this direction before anything happens. So that's the argument. So. Um, uh, that means that the angle between the vertical field and the, the slanted field uh, will not be large enough, of course, because the diffusivity on the sun in the solar corona is very, very low. So in principle, you should be able to get 90 degrees in the end. 
uh, and that will mean that the topology is going to be wrong. <clears throat> now, um, there's um, at least two problems with this. Um, the first problem is probably the most critical. <coughs> Actually, we have in this experiment, there'll be no reconnection whatsoever. Um, you have these two plates, and you are sliding them along each other, but if you don't bring the flux together, you don't get any reconnection. So the first, this experiment doesn't actually work at all. But let's now for, uh, just uh, let's just imagine that, well, it happens anyway. So we are breaking a couple of physics laws, but let's just do it just for the fun of it. So the velocity, um, the velocity we are looking at, it was high on the one of the plates and it was zero on the other one. And uh, it's a discontinu discontinuous uh, function. It's a step function in velocity. Now, we of course know in nature that this is not going to happen. So we can say, well, we'll just let it change over a distance uh, delta y. So we'll make it look like this instead. Then uh, the magnetic field will, in the end, look like this. It'll be turning over over a certain distance. And the gradient in the magnetic field will have something to do with this gradient that's set by the velocity field. So that, that then means that now, if we believe that even though there's no velocity in this direction, so you're actually not pressing the flux together, which means that you don't get reconnection, but now we say we do that anyway, then the gradient of the magnetic field is not set by uh, the time that this has been shifted, by, but by the gradient in the velocity field. And as long as we then resolve the gradient in the velocity field, then we'll also resolve the gradient in B. So the argument, even after breaking a couple of physical laws, doesn't actually apply. OK, so what is uh, this code that we have written? It's a sixth order radiative MHD code. It's on a staggered grid. Um, a staggered grid basically just means that the variables aren't placed the same place in space. Some of them are half a point down than the other ones. Some of them are half a point down in one direction and half a point in another. But um, thanks to maths, you won't have to think too much about that, but I'll come back to that in a, in a second. It has a variable resolution in Z, so in height. Um, the radiation that's implemented includes scattering, which is, of course, important uh, in the chromosphere. It's uh, massively parallel, and it scales uh, up to at least 32,000 CPU cores. 64. We have 64, I'm sorry. <laughs> We'll try 128 next time. All right. <clears throat> so how, it is act how does it actually work? Well, it basically, it just has a skeleton. And then you plug in whatever you like in your experiment. So you can choose your form of radiation. You can choose if you want MHD or just hydro. You can choose what sort of, uh, sort of technical CPU communication you have, which time stepping routine you want which boundary conditions, which equation of state, and which extra physics. And the strength of this code is that this thing is uh, continuously evolving. So what we have at the moment is we have Spitzer conduction. That's, of course, important mostly in the corona. Uh, so field-aligned thermal conduction. We have uh, line scattering, uh, UV absorption, Lyman alpha absorption, um, these are all based on a scheme that Max and Jorrit came up with a couple of years ago. Um, we can implement a generalized Ohm's law. We have uh, non-equilibrium hydrogen ionization. We have non-equilibrium metals, uh, where you can choose what um, sort of uh, metal you want to look at. 
And finally, we almost have non-equilibrium helium ionization as well. Thomas, are you done? Yeah, I think so. All right. <laughs> <laughs> But in the experiment that's uh, included here in the, um, in the data set, these are the ones that are included. <clears throat> the simulation itself, it out, outputs a number of variables. Uh, and then these are the primary variables that comes out. It's the density, the velocity, the internal energy, and the magnetic field. It also. Uh, it also exports the temperature, the pressure, and the electron density. It's in a box that's 24 by 24 by 17 megameters, and it's supposed to mimic uh, an enhanced network, which means that the typical uh, flux in the photosphere is somewhere between 30 to 50 gauss. <clears throat> uh, to run this thing took about 100 days on 512 CPU cores. And all the data from this thing uh, takes up 831 gigabytes. Uh, for some reason, the uh, organizers of this uh, meeting didn't want us to get a, a stick that could contain this thing. So, so we've had to decrease the amount of data that's actually included. Um, so the data has been repacked into FIT files. And if you want more details about all of this, you should let read the IRIS technical note number 33. <clears throat> uh, the, the numerical size of the box is 504 by 54 by 496 with, a, with this uh, resolution, 48 kilometers horizontally. And then the uneven set axis makes a, a resolution of somewhere between 19 and 97 kilometers. And uh, the high resolution is, of course, in the, uh, the upper photosphere, the chromosphere, and the transition region, while the 97 kilometers is usually or is up in the, in the uh, corona. Um, the numerical box goes from a couple of megameters below the photosphere to, uh, let's see, uh, sort of 15 megameters above. And uh, this has now been. Uh, been reduced, so now the boxes that you will work with in not too long about, is about half that size. That also means that the resolution is worse in all directions. Okay, but this is not the this is not what the code has actually worked with. It's worked with this. Okay, so I've tried to tell you that all is fantastic. Uh, but there are, of course, shortcomings. <clears throat> First of all, it's, uh, this is an experiment that was run a while ago. Um, the resolution in set is probably sort of marginal. Uh, the horizontal resolution is something else. As I said, the, uh, what, we, what we believe is that as as long as you don't try to get information that's sort of subgrid scale, um, scale will be fine. Uh, but we have run experiments all the way down to a horizontal resolution of about three kilometers, and we do see we do see uh, structures on pretty much all scales all the way down. Um, what since the resolution is um, marginal then what happens at the same time is that uh, we don't get small scale events. And that also means that short time scales are usually not well represented. These two usually uh, are, uh, have something to do with each, each other. If it happens on small scales, it also can often happen on short time scales. And that means that if you want to look after something like spicules, EUV bright dots, uh, RBEs, RREs, and whatever, uh, it's uh, difficult. So um, I think that's about all I have to say. Juan, will you, do you want to continue? I don't think it's time for coffee yet. 
No one has a question. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, you have uh, what are for users uh, available only fifty kilometers in Zagushka, right? It's it's um, this is what's available if you get it from the Iris homepage. This is what you have on your stick. I'm sorry? Uh, your code cannot uh, capture shockwaves. It can capture shockwaves uh, up until this resolution. As I said, uh, the you you cannot uh, you cannot extract sub resolution data from a numerical uh, numerical simulation. It cannot be done. <clears throat> Any more questions? What are the boundary conditions? Uh, let me get to that in just a second. Yes. Generalized Ohm's law can be coupled to MHD. Yeah, so you just get extra terms. So do you have electric field? Not in the pure MHD, but they do enter in the generalized Ohm's law. Yeah. Okay. Uh, boundary conditions. Yes. Um, the um, the boundary condition. Uh, it's. Um, it is uh, periodic in the horizontal directions. Uh, the bottom boundary, so these about two megameters below the photosphere, is uh, it's an advanced hot plate. So we are pumping in entropy uh, in the locations where there's an inflow into the box. And we make sure that the total flux uh, on the bottom boundary is zero, so that we are not losing mass or increasing the mass in the box. <coughs> the upper boundary is a bit of a magic thing. Uh, oh, it's based on it's uh, <laughs> based on characteristic boundaries. So basically, you you calculate the characteristics for all the stuff coming uh, towards the boundary, and then you extrapolate those characteristics into the uh, out of the box. So it's if you have a, a very simple boundary condition, whatever you, if you send a shock wave up, a, up towards the boundary, it will just reflect, and you will see these uh, interference patterns close to the uh, to the boundary of the numerical box. But uh, this has has been, this can be overcome by this uh, method of extrapolating the characteristics of the of the plasma movements. From a magnetic field for this initial boundary condition? Um, it's. Uh, Matt, you have to help me on that one. It's uh, You're pumping in horizontal fields, right? No, this one here is uh, with a uh, two main polarities, I mean, opposite polarities separated by about eight megameters, and then potential feed extrapolation from that from the bottom boundary, and that's after the box has relaxed. The hydrodynamics has relaxed. Then that is introduced, and then it runs for uh, half an hour or so the time before we start. So it's fixed. It's all boundary. It's magnetic field is fixed. No. How do you come and magnetic field? I mean, what? So the bottom boundary is just you start out with a polarity here on the bottom boundary, which is two meter megameters below the photosphere. So you start out by having two polarities. And then you make an, a potential extrapolation. So you get a field which goes through the whole box. And then you let the, uh, the convection uh, move the field around. And that's why you see it concentrated in these small patches. So what's the boundary condition for a magnetic field? On the bottom. Yeah. Uh, the, that's, uh, I think it's just being extrapolated. It's moved? I mean, it's allowed yeah, to yeah, it's allowed to move. 
It's not, uh, it's not a superconductor, the bottom boundary. It's allowed to move around. So it's being, it's being advected with the velocity field that's present in the box. And then uh, at the actual boundary, it's just extrapolated out of the box. But the magnetic field continue to the conversion path. Well, there will not be anything advected into the box because uh, the um, 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 Yes, uh, it does. But the time scale is several days at the bottom of the And this is only. But here, it cannot be several days uh, for two megahertz layer. Because uh, time scale is much shorter. The time scale, but it, it, that's not the diffusion time. It's not the diffusion time. The turnover time of the granulation is short. But that only means that this thing is moved around. It doesn't mean that the field disappears in that time. Okay. Any more questions? You can check this once you've uh, participated in the uh, exercise. <laughs> it took a couple of thousand years. All right. One. Thank you. We need this. Now that Boris explained what you can do or cannot do with Bifrost, I basically am going to show uh, how to uh, look at the data with SolarSoft that is available with Iris. Uh, first of all, I'm going to repeat a little bit uh, where to find the documentation. In the Iris webpage, you can find the ITM 33 and 34. The first one explains a little bit about how uh, are said the setup of the simulation, how is the setup of the simulations and the headers of the FITS files and then the 34 is basically explains how to run the different routines that are available in the SolarSoft in order to uh, read the data, analyze or so on so on. And there's also a published paper about the Bifrost code itself in Goodixen 2011. And for this tutorial we like you to go to the web page that is in the bottom left corner. There you will see some commands that are going to be useful for copy and paste uh, in your terminal in order to do things slightly faster if you want to follow the tutorial. I'll let uh, just copy and to copy the link. Good. <laughs> okay, I'll go for the next slide now. Uh, you can get the files uh, also from. Doesn't work? Uh, okay. File. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can download the data, the FITS files, also from that web page. Uh, there's a tag in modeling where you can find the simulation. If you press there, it will show up a short description of the simulations. Uh, 
in the future, if we want to put more sim different, different kind of simulations, we will implement it in that page. Then once you select the simulation, you can, it will appear that window where you can select the variables that you want to download. Uh, all these variables are the ones that Boris already mentioned. And uh, once you decided which one you want to download, next page will allow you to select the snapshots that you want to download. Don't do it now because you will uh, uh, use the, all the path in the, in the Wi-Fi connection, <laughs> and we don't want that. <laughs> For that, you have the sticks where you have a small uh, version of the of this data. And you can get uh, up to 180 snapshots, basically, and the separation between the snapshots is 10 seconds. Uh, okay. Now to get ready for those who want to follow the the um, tutorial, I, here is where you can start to copy and paste some of the commands that are in the web page. Basically, you copy the file. Just for, first, copy the tar files. Only the tar files, please. Don't do the uh, routines, uh, the ideal routines that are, are there, because those are, those are old. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> then you can compress. One way to do it is uh, in a single line, is, uh, as I show in this slide. Also in the web page, you can, this command is there. You can copy and paste in your terminal and do it in one goal. The second thing is uh, there's a, unless you did the solar soft upgrade today, I strongly suggest to download the. Um, ideal routines that are in this other link and compress and copy in the sol uh, solar soft uh, iris path that is uh, uh, shown here basically then uh, in addition to that we need to create a bfrost environmental variable can be the example shown in the slide uh, in addition to that, you need to create also that folder, uh, plus IDL slash data slash the lines. And uh, for this tutorial, it will be great if you have Chianti also, not only IDs and uh, your solar soft packages. Uh, sorry? Oh, this, this link you mean? Yeah. No. That, that's... Oh, tiny, uh, that tiny URL, uh, okay, uh, dot com slash L R Q R F 7 J. Okay, I will continue now. Looks like uh, there's some guess. <laughs> um, okay, how to get started? Well, now we can launch uh, SolarSoft inside the um, uh, folder where we have the fit files. And again, you can find all these command lines in the web page. Then if you are lazy or you don't want to make any typo, just copy and paste. The first two lines is basically, well, the first one basically search for the fit files uh, related with the simulation. The next one, it creates an object. Uh, using these fit files and in order to read for example one variable in this case I'm showing the temperature is doing that line command it's a you call to the object try to load the variable temperature or in the snapshot 385 uh, that will be the data in the object if you want to have it in an array basically then you can what you can do is uh, put the name of the variable that you want to Save the data, dd uh, slash get var, and that will bring from the object to the variable the the array. One way to do all of, all these two lines in one line it would be something like that. There's also some header parameters that you can also read from these object uh, commands. For example, you can read C axis, the axis. That will be something like that. You can do it for the X and Y axis. 
you can get the times the uh, time in the snapshot that will be get p The DD object new. That's what the. If you did follow all the steps, that's what you will get. Something that looks like that. Or like that. Better? No, not better. Hmm. That's going to be unfortunate. They'll relaunch. It it doesn't fit in my screen. That's something really nice from the IDL that I cannot. <laughs> I don't know how to fix it, but I can tell you what is below. Well, the layout, I mean, it shows um, on your left a, collect a collection of options. On the right, the main window will show you two images of a slide through the data that you uploaded. The color bar corresponds to the image, uh, to, the, to the image. Below that you will see plots, which basically are plots at the um, vertical and uh, horizontal axis of the variable that you are uh, seeing in the 2D slide. Okay, there's uh, the first option I want to show first is a display mode. Basically, that allows you to change the uh, slide cut, the axis of the slide cut. The one I want to show, uh, select is uh, XC, for example. And here you can start to recognize some structures already. Um, uh, you have uh, the vertical axis is the C axis, the horizontal is the uh, X axis. And this bar will uh, uh, allow you to move through the domain. Okay. Uh, in the bottom, in order to f um, uh, control the two panels below, there's also a bar where you can also move. Well, I can't, but you can. Uh, <laughs> you, you move the bar, from, and you, what it will do is move uh, along the vertical axis or horizontal axis how it looks like the variable that we are plotting. We can also, since I have that, I can also put here some number and it will move wherever I want, or I tried. There's also the option, if you know the exact coordinations, you can also choose the value in the x axis or y axis. Uh, then now let's go back to the main plot. Uh, the first thing say is I am one of the few that I doesn't like the gray color in uh, Oslo, and that's for I'll, we can change color tables. Let's go for some more co Ibiza. colorful. They like to call it Ibiza or whatever. Um, uh, the, in the top row, we, see, we have options where we can do quick uh, operations on the image that we are seeing. For example, if we can grab a box and do a zoom, and it will pump up a window where you can see how it looks like. That's one thing. We can do average along the x or y axis. That means if I do now another box here, what I see is the temperature where we did a, an average within that domain. OK? Uh, it crashes when it does the zoom. Oh, that I don't know. Must be some of the. Do you know? Um, in principle, I know, but it's about 10 years ago. It should be in one of the solar soft packages, but I don't know which one. Which one? Ice. Ice, OK. Uh, yeah. OK. It would be nice if you are including your solar soft instruments eyes. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue. The below the bar where you can go through the box, we have uh, two uh, set of bars where we can actually 
control the domain that we want to plot to show in the 2D. It, these things actually handles flipping axes, as you can see. If I do off from one, now I flip the axis. It's uh, nice for the the, the ones that has uh, uh, likes to look, for example, to the south pole. Then that's a way to reverse the z-axis, for example. Saying that, I'm going back to the uh, normal layout. Below, there's um, options to control the intensity. You can change the values on, by hand if you want, and it will show up, or just moving the bar. You can, you know, the index, you can play also with the index of color. <coughs> Below that, hmm, <laughs> there's a set of options. Let me see if I can, no. I will do that by memory. Do you think that it will work? Where is the... Oh, yes. Perfect. Almost. Oh, yeah. oh great. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, almost. <laughs> yeah, this bit, this bit is Vigo's fault, yeah. <laughs> Okay, more or less. Okay, okay. We can do logarithmic scales. Just pressing the lock. If it's uh, if we have, for example, velocities, we can do absolute values. For that case, it doesn't matter. We can do auto scale, which basically why is not doing the auto scale right? <laughs> Don't worry. Maybe not. Okay, now. Okay, uh, but basically what we we'll do the auto scale is take pick up the maximum and the minimum in that slide and we'll choose that once. Otherwise what it's doing is picking up the maximum and the minimum of the full domain that we load in this uh, object. We can do turn to the variable, it wouldn't make too much sense. In this case and actually it's doing overflow. Um, then the, these three ones allows you to put, uh, to overplot lines, vectors, contours. I, before I go to that one, there's also a, with the fits files, it's a completely useless bottom. But for the bifros, we usually have the z-axis reverse. And that's, um, that did allow us to change the orientation of the z-axis to make it, make it more friendly, unless you are really used to see things upside down. Um, uh, in addition to these two plots, uh, there's also the option to launch a new widget, which lets you to go through the full domain along one axis and see how it looks like the variable. And in the, in the difference between that one and these ones is that here you can only move to the one of the axes. Here we have, can move along both axes, the other two axes. Uh, first dim plot, second dim plot, third dim plot. What? Okay, uh, you need eyes for that one too. Yeah. 
there's a below the we can close do animations I'm not going to do that one yet uh, and also show params which I'm not going to show that one yet below that one that we have inf some sort of info which is lacking of info and that's for when we press value on the top of the option of the four options we have and we click on the anywhere in the to the image it will show up the value of the temperature, the location where we are uh, clicking, uh, which might be useful if you want to find out what are the values. Okay, now lines. We can. The default is that uh, when I press lines, it will show out magnetic field lines. The default for vectors will show uh, velocity vectors, and the def default for the contours is going to be plasma beta. We can change that, I'll show you later. First, if I press lines, what is going to happen, if you look at your IDL, is reading the magnetic field, uh, fits files, and it will pump up many lines into the, to the image, over plotting. Um, let's say I don't want to have that many lines, or I want to put the seats in a really specific location. There's a way to do that, there's a, in options, we have line setup. It will pump up a window where you can choose the variable. B means magnetic field. It's usually the first letter of the variable that we want to trace. If we put U, for example, what, what we'll get is going to be uh, velocity streamlined. Number of seat, seat points. Um, we can choose the color of the line. For example, if I press 204, it will show red in this case, I'm not going to draw yet. And I, uh, the bars on the right, you will select the area where you want, where we put the seats to draw the fill lines. Let's say I want all the seat really high in the corona, that's probably. And then I press draw. And what it will do, it will recalculate the, hopefully, and it, all the seat points now are uh, in the corona. Okay, red. and it's red because I asked to be right in the color index. We can also add, uh, I don't know if you're going to see that in my screen, but probably you can see in yours. If you add a line direction, it will show arrows and it will tell you where is the, where, where are the pointing, uh, the magne where is pointing the magnetic field. This, this must just be a projection of the field lines. Oh. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the lines can go through the plane, of course, but not the seats. The seats has been located in that plane. That means they are equally distributed within the domain that we selected here. Uniform grid. Uniform grid. Oh, when? <laughs> okay, let me finish with the magnetic field, and then we have a break. There's only two more things. Since the seats are located in the plane, if I move the plane, it will recalculate the magnetic field lines. Then, for example, if I, uh, someone wants to do animation of that, it will take very long time because it will calculate for each plane new seat points. It will calculate new field lines and will draw the single image, and that may take a pretty long time. I'm not going to do that here. Okay. Uh, now we can have a break. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'm going to continue. Um, I just uh, was describing how to draw field lines in the to the images. There's also the option of uh, do uh, vectors. If I press directly, it will show the velocity field vector. <coughs> Similar to the magnetic field, you have the vector setup, which is on the right, on the left side, you have options of uh, the uh, head of the arrow or the length. You can, in that case, you can use, I don't think random works anyway. Uh, anyway. 
uh, you can put the number of seats. That means the number of vectors are going to show up uh, square. That means there's a hundred of vectors. And the variable, in this case, is the velocity. If I select the magnetic field, then it will calculate, it will read the magnetic field, and it will show the magnetic field vector. Similar to the magnetic field, we can choose the area where we want to have the vectors, and it should work. And it will plot only arrows where we want. Now, the same for the contours. If I press contour, it will read the necessary data and we will plot something. In that case, it's not plotting something because the default setup is not within the range. Oh, I should. See up. Can, can you copy that uh, error message and send to someone else? With counter, okay. Don't run counter. <laughs> There's a bug there. That, uh, uh, ah, well, that's uh, for the contours uh, that you cannot run it anyway. Uh, well, uh, only the ones who has uh, the full BFRAS simulation uh, should be able to do that. Or you Looks like there must be missing uh, something somewhere. I thought I removed all of them. Um, in options, we have uh, two more things. We can change the layout of the um, uh, image in the main plot. This is in the layout setup options. We can change uh, color range. We can change the size of the uh, letters. We can change the background color. Uh, for example, if I put 255, then I will have white backgrounds. Probably not a good idea. Let's move back. Uh, to we can do reset. That also should work. We go back to the um, default setup. In addition to that, there's also float HDR params. Basically, that plot will allow you to read headers information. For that, you need to know which header you want to read in. For example, this is uh, one of the diffusive parameters that we have in the code. We press enter. Since we have only one snapshot, what it will show is just the number and the time step. We can choose also uh, effective temperature, and it will show me the effective temperature of that snapshot. Uh, I'll do not now. If we go now uh, to the next, let me let's go to now to the next slide of the talk. We can what we can do is uh, also load in the object a time series. That's uh, the object has to be always three dimensions or lower. Cannot be four. In that case. Uh, uh, then in that case, what the, uh, in order to load. Um, time series, basically you select the, vari the variable that you want, and id in this case is now a vector. So this is not in your file? It, it is in the web, uh, web page, it's the second. It says continue something, yeah. Um, and uh, you can choose which plane you want to read. If you select, for example, ic, that means the plane we are uh, going to load is uh, x, y. If we tell to the load i, x, and a number, it will load uh, y, c component. Um, I, now that I have that slide, I had a question, how many variables are, or what kind of variables we can load? There's a help in the BR XMSD tool that can show that, but the other, another way to do that is if you do load and then uh, the variable is empty, it will print out a list of variables that you can actually read. No, it crashes in no file call. Oh, try with 385. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what else? 
Okay, now let's go back to the demo. I'm going to launch now the time series. No, no, it's a space. Okay. Now, if we launch the BRXMST tool, the first thing that you will see is that instead of having an X, Y plane, now we have X, C plane in the axis one and two. That means the third axis is actually a time evolution. We do that and let me put um, uh, out the scale. Now we see x-axis and how it changes the temperature as a function of time. Of course, if you try to draw field lines here, it won't make sense, and you will get a warning, don't try to do that. But it will work if you, if you go back to the uh, space axis. If you press lines, it should work. It will read the data, and it will draw the field lines. Now, the rest of the things are the same. I'm going to do here an animation. It will take me a minute, maybe. In the meanwhile, I cannot do it anymore. <laughs> what it will show is a new window where basically it's a um, has all the information to do the uh, <coughs> all the images as a function of time. Okay, it's, we have it here. The nice thing is uh, it includes, if you have magnetic field lines, it will include the field lines. If you have outer scale, it will do the outer scale in each plane uh, or vectors. If we press play, you can see how it changes. Um, so now about comment that uh, Vigo pointed out is that if now if we want to read the headers, what and if we press play, uh, we read something. It will read the headers of each snapshot and it will do a plot. We want, for example, the effective temperature, which that's how it's changing between these snapshots, the effective temperature as a function of time. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, I think this is all about the BR HMSD tool that I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. There's help which should work. Yeah. Pump up something and you can move. It's a funny look. Looks really funny, but I was lazy and basically I did uh, some. Quick nasty trick of convert tech file to the to that widget tool format. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. No, then you don't have manual. Okay. Okay, I'll fix that one. Thanks. Okay, now I go back to the presentation. Mm, I wanted to say that uh, there's also the option of uh, using CRISP specs. For those who are really familiar with CRISP specs, you can convert uh, the data into a, some sort of level three formats of the FITS files. That will take forever to do it here. Uh, and uh, basically what is, instead of a spectra, well, the third axis is going to be the special dimension, the third special dimension. And then you should be able to run CRISPR with uh, uh, this data too. There's, uh, this is some of the variables that you can read. You can uh, also find that in the documentation, in the ITM34. There's way much more than this, but this is at least a fair bit of the variables that you can load or calculated, or the um, uh, solar soft routines will calculate it for you. 
I also want to point out that you can uh, read, you can, not read, uh, you, the routines allows us uh, to calculate the synthetic variables in, using optical hidden approximation and the Chianti database. Then if we do, if you want to do that test, basically. Bar equals silicon four four one four two underscore p and then ed load bar the snapshot it will read the temperature density and electron density will uh, find out the abundant whoops. It will find out the abundance from Chianti database, and this is the emission measure. This is the emission measure in the domain. If you want to calculate the integrity, you basically need to multiply by the axis and integrate along the axis. And that's going to be actually the first exercise, if you want to do the exercise. <laughs> uh, I propose to do the following. Unless you want to do your own stuff, that feel free to do that, and I, we are also going to try to help you. But one possibility, if you don't have, uh, uh, if you want to do this other option, it's basically try to figure out if we can see in, using transition region spectral lines uh, uh, undefined uh, fine structures. These are the. <coughs> Uh, loops observed in uh, iris with uh, transition region lines, silicon Ford, for example. I want you to uh, read the emission measure, try to calculate the intensity from there along the vertical axis, I mean, integrated along the vertical axis. Then, we will, next step, we'll try to follow, uh, cal cal calculate field lines and see if the field lines follow these structures. Uh, I'm going to give you some help to, uh, for the field lines in the next slide. Next uh, thing will be uh, try to figure out what are the thermodynamics along this field line, and time evolution, and so on and so on. To help you, there's a, well, there's an also similar exercise without Chianti. For those who didn't manage to run Chianti, or who doesn't have Chianti in the solar soft packages, just uh, select a uh, temperature somewhere in the transition region, look for a structure that looks like a loop format uh, or looks like a loop, trace field lines and see if it looks like if they follow these structures follow the field lines. Basically it's the same as the other one but without calculating the emission coming from the uh, silicon port for example. And now how to calculate field lines? You can, you, if you have your own routines or you want to code that yourself, Go ahead. Uh, if you are lazy, just uh, copy and paste this. Uh, what I is doing here, this n x and x y is going to create an array uh, that uh, will tell me what, how many points will have the field lines. Uh, and R0 is uh, the location in the 3D domain. There's no that uh, we need to shift the domain uh, to zero in the bottom part. That's why I put minus C O where C O is minus C. And then you just run this line. If we do that, it should calculate the field. Why do we do this? The thing? The What? Well, which is? Do you have the latest? Uh, no, it's uh, our thing. But the, uh, the latest uh, uh, ideal routines, I guess, should have that fixed. Okay. But if you have the latest ideal routines, should that should be fixed? Really? I, I'm coming back. Okay. okay, if I do, 
If I do this, it's calculating. Now we can, one th nice thing is about the BR XMSD tool is that you can actually put the information of the fill lines into the tool. The way to do that is input <coughs> fill and provide the vectors. And if I launch the BR XMSD tool and I draw fill lines, now it's not going to put a distributed fill lines, but just draw the three fill lines that I ask to draw. And here is a proof that this routine seems to work. <laughs> okay, I'll go first with you. But what, what was the problem? The but NE compute shouldn't be used with the BR ion that I gave. Can I see, can you open BR underscore I, I, I am? Uh, sorry, I, I am. <laughs> and I'm going to check that. because you're missing the last line. Now the lines. Some missing information here. Or here. No, but where is the example to do this? Can uh, we calculate the silicon four intensity? Oh, you just basically uh, you just basically choose the variable when you do. You do for example, that one instead of. You had in bar you had PGs eh? instead of PG you have silicon four underscore one four four two underscore oh, and then it doesn't? Yeah, this is much. Oh shit. No, no it doesn't. <laughs> no because Ah, okay. But it should do it. Yeah, he's trying to read abundances, yeah. Not uh, put eight for eight uh, three five for example here in this number. Oh, this number? Yeah. Eight, eight three five. Just because you don't have the snapshot. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do you find out which variables you can load? Uh, if you do uh, dd slash, uh, no, not so sorry, dd arrow play comma space and then there's an option 385. This is a list of variables. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sometimes, sometimes when you run, uh, when you try to calculate the magnetic field lines, I don't know when that's happened, and I don't, I'm not really sure why. Uh, it crashes, saying that the mode variable is not defined. In that case, just do mode equals, and then put something inside, and launch the routine again, and it should work. Okay. It doesn't. when you're trying to read a time series. And in that case, basically, what you will do is put mode equals xy. And that should fix it. If you're running, if uh, it is, if, um, is a vector, then please define mode. I would put that in the palm. <laughs> yes. Oh no, that one is because you have the 
an old version of that one. Oh, Like with the exercise?